Good evening, everyone. Here we go. Looks like I've already got somebody on here. You got a thumbs up. Yay! Thank you for the thumbs up. Hope everybody's having a great day today. Um, today we're starting something that's going to be, uh, I guess, a, a 10 part series. Uh, it seems like a lot of parts, even more than Harry Potter books. Um, this is going to, we are going to read Surviving the Apple Whites by Stephanie Tolan. Uh, see, it's a bigger book. It is worth, uh, it's a level 5.5 book in AR. It's worth seven points. That's why by the time we get to Monday the 13th, finish up this book. I'm going to read three chapters a day. Then you can take a test and you can get a ton of points. But like I said, here we go. Surviving the Apple Whites by Stephanie Tolan. Test number 6052. But... And I put that in the comments, but like I said, you won't be needing that anytime soon because it's, uh, like I said, we got a few more days on it. But if you want to write that down, save it. It's always going to be in the comments down below. Also, I hope everybody likes this. And if you can, share this information out. Share it on Facebook. Share it on anything. Say, hey, come to my channel, please. I would really appreciate people saying that, saying, hey, go to Mr. Westner. Uh, Mr. Westner reads that uh, Westner 77 is my channel. Go to that channel and, uh, like or subscribe to this channel and listen to our books and hopefully it kind of helps you out and it's just kind of a fun way to make it through this uh this school closure this quarantine um uh, and as a way to get a ton of points and i know like uh for at my school our, our my reading teacher fourth grade she's keeping up with book it she's keeping up with uh, ar points and um it's a great way to just just get a ton of points but that being said, let's go ahead. Let's dig into surviving the Apple Whites. Um, no, I'm not going to lie. This was a present from my wife. When I first started teaching, she got me this book. Um, I taught fifth grade, and she got me this book. This is a Newbery Honor book. Um, it's been Oh, it's been years since I've read it. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of brush up on the story. That's why I wanted to read it. Um, I do remember. I'll read you the backs of uh, Jake Simple. Was uh, is notorious. Rumor has that he burned down his old school and got kicked out of every school in his home state. Only one place will take him now, and that's a home school run by the Applewhites, a chaotic and hilarious family of artists. The only one who doesn't fit the Applewhite mold is Ed, a smart, sensible girl who immediately clashes with this the unruly Jake. Jake survive, thinks surviving this one will be a breeze. But he is really, but is he really as tough or as bad as he seems? Yes, this is a book. This and uh, this is it's it's gonna be fun. Let's talk about homeschooling. So hey, it kind of fits right now. So there we go. See, do I have I thought I saw something here? No. It's kind of fun thing about old books. Sometimes you find something here. Like I said, reading three chapters a day. Reading chapters one through three today. Tomorrow I'll be four through six. Just keep going on and on. So every day at six thirty, come on in for surviving the Apple Whites. I would try and do the voices like I sometimes do, but that just won't happen this time because I know I will forget. Aha! That being said, let's begin. My name is not Eddie. It's E D. E period D period. What kind of name is that? The boy slouching against the porch railing had scarlet spiked hair, a silver ring through one dark brown eyebrow, and too many earrings to count. He was dressed entirely in black, black t-shirt, black jeans, black high top running shoes, and the look in his eyes was pure mean. My kind, E.D. Applewhite said. She had no intention of telling this creep the story of her name. She could tell by looking at him that he'd never heard of Edith Wharton, her mother's favorite writer, being, being probably the only almost 14-year-old girl in the whole country named Edith. She had no intention of giving him even the little bit of ammunition to use against her ED, she thought was at least dignified, like a corporate executive, which one day she just might be. What kind of name is Jake Simple? Two can play at that game, the boy's face said. Mine. Not an original bone in his body, Edie thought. Just a plain, ordinary delinquent. 
According to her friend Melissa, though, Jake Simple was famous. He had been kicked out of the public schools in the whole state of Rhode Island. Melissa wasn't sure what all he'd done to achieve that particular distinction, but the word around Traybridge was that one thing he did was burn down his old school. He'd come to North Carolina to live with his grandfather, Henry Dugan, a neighbor of the Applewhites, and go to Traybridge Middle School. The plan had not lasted long. No one in living memory had been thrown out of Traybridge Middle School, but Jake Sipple had managed to accomplish the feat in three weeks flat. At least the building was still standing. It was only the middle of September, and he had run out of schools that were willing to risk taking him. Mr. Dugan was inside at that moment discussing with Edie's parents, her Aunt Lucille, Uncle Archie, and Grandpa Zedediah, the arrangements the two families and Jake's social worker had worked out for continuing Jake's education. Jake Sipple was the first person Edie had ever met who had a social worker. She thought that was probably only one step away from having a probation officer, which is what Jake's parents would have when they got out of jail. That was why Jake had a social worker because his parents were in jail for growing um, marijuana and uh, in their basement and offering some to an off-duty sheriff's deputy. ED didn't know how long they were going to be in jail, but at least but at least a year. She figured criminal tendencies ran in families. The kid had burned down his school just after his parents were arrested. Edie's Aunt Lucille was a poet and had been uh, conducting a workshop at Traybridge Middle School when Jake was kicked out. The whole terrible idea had been hers. She told Mr. Dugan about the Creative Academy, which is, was what Edie's father had named the Applewhite Home School. Only Aunt Lucille, whose view of life was almost pathologically sunny, would get the, the idea that after an entire state had admitted it couldn't cope with the kid, and after Traybridge Middle School had been defeated in less than a month, the Applewhites would take him in. The Creative Academy didn't even have any trained teachers, let alone guidance counselors and armed security guards. There were a whole bunch of buildings the kid could burn down at wit's end. The main house, all eight cottages, the goat shed, a tool shed, and the barn. But somehow Aunt Lucille had convinced everybody else E.D. had been the only family member to vote against letting Jake Simple join them. Jake begged her grandfather, who usually had more sense than all the rest of the family combined, to put a stop to the idea. Uh, you know how Aunt Lucille can't ever believe a bad thing about anybody, she told him. Her attitude about people is downright dangerous. He'd only twiddled with his mustache and said that his that he rather envied Lucille's rose-colored view of things. More often than not, he, I've noticed it turns out to be true. Then he had declared taking Jake Simple in a noble and socially responsible thing to do. Noble and socially responsible. More like suicidal, Edie thought. She had thought that even before she laid eyes on Jake Simple, now she was sure of it. Jake pulled a cigarette out of the pack of his T-shirt pocket. Better not light that thing, she said, thinking about lighters and matches and very large fires. Wits End is a smoke-free environment. The boy reached into his pocket and pulled out a yellow plastic lighter. You can have a smoke-free environment outdoors, he said. We can have it anywhere we want. This is our property, all 16 acres of it. Jake looked at her square in the eye and lit the cigarette. He took a long drag and blew the smoke directly into her face so that she had to close her eyes and hold her breath to keep from choking on it. Then he said one of Paulette's favorite phrases. No one had managed to break Grandpa's adoptive parent, uh, uh, swearing he suspected that they wouldn't have uh, have any better luck with Jake Simple. Okay, pretty heavy stuff. Jake's a pretty bad dude. But yet this, this creative academy looks like, I wonder if they'll be able to handle her. Handle him. Chapter two. So far, so good, Jake thought. This girl was bugged by cursing and smoking. He had news for her. He intended to do a whole lot of both. He took a long drag on his cigarette and blew the smoke at her again. She turned away and moved down to the other end of the porch steps. 
Doesn't bother me, girl. You can bug off completely as far as I'm concerned. Jake hadn't been any more than two years old when he found out how certain words affected people. It had surprised him considerably since his parents used those words at home all the time. He learned them the same way he learned all the other words he knew. People didn't make a fuss when his parents used them, but once he'd seen how some adults reacted to those words when he said them, it had become a game. He could still remember the old woman with the mean, pinched-up face who told him to take his sticky fingers off the display case when his mother took him to the bakery to get on his third birthday. He had smiled his best little boy smile and said just two words. The woman had gone all white and slumped right down on the floor. The image was as clear in his mind now as if it had happened yesterday. The way she just disappeared all of a sudden from behind the counter. All the fuss and fear afterward had made a permanent impression on him. Nobody could ever tell Jake's simple words didn't have power. If the rest of the Applewhites were saying or were anything like this girl, he thought he ought to be able to bug them quite a lot for however long he was going to be stuck with them. He leaned back against the support post behind him and watched the smoke float out from his nostrils. He hated adults making decisions for him and expecting him to just go along with whatever they said. His parents had tried that and given up. But because of that big mistake they'd made with the sheriff's deputy, they'd been carted off to their separate minimum security prisons. And he was stuck with a bunch of strangers who didn't get it that he wasn't going to do what he he didn't want to do. He would just have to uh, show them. He intended this time here to be even shorter than his time at Traybridge Middle School. The smoky part was going to be a problem, though. This was the last pack of cigarettes. It was miles to town and out here in the North Carolina boonies. There was no such thing as a bus. He squinted against the smoke that was blowing back at him. Now, maybe since there were tobacco fields uh, along just about every road, he could tear off a few leaves and learn to roll his own. He was pretty sure this girl had been told to keep an eye on him while his grandfather was inside to make sure he didn't set fire to the porch or something. She wasn't much to look at, not much shape yet, still as much like a boy as a girl, and then chopped off hair didn't help much. She was sitting there now with her uh, scabby elbows on her scabby knees, staring off down the driveway. Jake didn't see the main road from here. The way the drive curved around a row of trees and bushes. But out there was a wooden sign with with wit's end spelled out of it with bark colored twigs. Quaint and rustic and weird. Jake had never known anyone who named their house before. His grandfather said the place had had a name ever since he was a kid. Um, it had been a farm till I went till it went bust and somebody bought it, built a bunch of scruffy little cabins up against the woods and turned it into a motor lodge. They named it the Bidawee. Bidawee added an office wing and and lived in the big two story house. Then the Applewhites, all artsy types, his grandfather said, had moved down from New York and bought it. The scruffy little cabins were still there. But now the house was part uh, was part house and part school. There were four apple white kids, but Jake had only met this one so far. This A B or C D or whatever her name was, being homeschooled. The apple whites hadn't been at Traybridge Middle School during uh, what he liked to think of was Jake's simple reign of terror. Uh, he wondered what the others were like. Suddenly, there was a scream from somewhere off on the right side of the house. A brown and white German Shepherd-sized animal with huge lopsided horns came tearing around the end of the porch and down toward the road. A long piece of white cloth with feathers on it streamed from his mouth and dragged on the ground, almost tangling in its legs as it ran. Right behind it, shouting at the top of, it, of her lungs, came a tall, barefoot girl in a black leotard. Jake nearly choked on the smoke he had just inhaled. This was the uh, this was easy to recognize as a girl. He thought she might uh, be the most gorgeous girl he'd ever seen. She was running at first, 
her long, heavy auburn hair streaming in the wind or streaming behind her. But she started hopping from one foot to the other when she reached the gravel. From then on, her shouting kept getting interrupted by little yelps of pain. The animal she was chasing was a goat, a smelly one. As fast as it had galloped by, it had left its odor very clearly on the in uh, on the air. Goat and girl disappeared around the bend in the driveway, but the shouting and yelping went on, getting fainter and fainter. Cordelia, the girl on the stoop on the step said, and Wolfie. Oh, what's all the fuss? Jake's grandfather came out of the house, a, a fat dog, a basset hound with ears so long it nearly walked on them with every step, waddling at his heels. The apple-white adults were right behind. The oldest of them, a wiry old man with white hair and a droopy white mustache, pushed his way through the others and headed straight for the wooden rocking chair in, in the corner of the porch. On his way, he snatched the cigarette out of Jake's hand so fast Jake didn't know what had happened till it was being ground out on the porch floor under the old man's shoe. Smoke-free environment, he said, and sat down on the rocker. Remember that. Everybody on the porch, including the basset hound, was looking at Jake, and he felt his face starting to heat up. He looked off the way the goat and the girl had gone, whistling under his breath to let them know that he had, didn't care, not at all. The breathtaking girl in the leotard was picking her way Back along the driveway, carrying what was left of the flowered material as if she had a dead baby in her arms. It was smudged in red brown dirt, smudged with red brown dirt and dotted with burrs. I'm going to murder that goat one of these days, she said. Lucille Applewhite, the frizzy haired blonde poet whose idea all this was, ran down the porch steps, one hand over her heart. You might have murdered him already, yelling and chasing him like that. He's probably lying in a heap under a bush somewhere, drawing his last breath. No, he's not. I chased him into the barn. Come off it, Lucille, the man with the shaggy dark hair and goatee said. According to the description Jake's grandfather had given him, this had to be Randolph Applewhite, the father of the Applewhite children. That smelly demon is ho uh, hostility personified. It would be, it'd take more than a little chasing to get him down. That isn't hostility. Wolfbane is uh, is suffering from post-traumatic stress. Lucille turned back to the girl in the leotard. Whatever, uh, whatever, uh, whatever were you doing in the goat pen? Cordelia st stamped her foot and yelped again. She had apparently forgotten she was standing in the gravel. Jake thought she had a particularly musical yelp. I was not in the goat pen. I was in the meadow. That beastly, smelly, disgusting creature was running loose again. He tried to murder me. It was lucky I had a piece of my costume with me to deflect him. Lucille let out a squeal. Loose? He was loose? What about Hazel? Where's Hazel? Cordelia stormed up the porch steps pushed her way through the crowd of people and stepped over the dog who had flopped down directly in front of the door. She's halfway to Traybridge for all I know. Ask Destiny. The screen door banged shut behind her. Destiny, the woman with reading glasses around her neck, who'd been jotting notes on a little notepad, looked up now as if she was just turning in or tuning in. She was famous, Jake knew. He'd even seen her on television once. She wrote best-selling mysteries about a florist who was an amateur detective. She was also the children's mother, but her name wasn't Applewhite. It was Jameson, Sybil Jameson. What about Destiny? She asked now. He's taking a nap. I sent him to his room half an hour ago, and he promised me he would take a nap. She, she stuck her notepad into her pocket and of her down, um, oversized shirt and put her pencil behind her ear. If he's out by himself somewhere, he we'd better find him. No telling what he's getting into. Uh, he'd better not be in the wood shop again. Last time he drilled holes in a footstool, I had nearly finished. The man who said this had a crew cut and was wearing a denim shirt with the uh, sleeves rolled up to show tattoos on both arms. This would be Archie Applewhite, Randolph's brother and Lucille's husband. He had the uh, he and the old man both made wooden furniture. 
Knowing your work, I can't believe it made it much difference, Randolph said. What are a few drill holes, more or less? You're just jealous because I have a gallery show coming up and you're out of work again. Stop arguing and help me find Hazel, Lucille said. If she gets out on the road, she'll be killed. Jake hadn't heard a single car go by the whole time he'd been there. Whoever Hazel was, she didn't seem likely to get run down uh, the minute uh, she was. She set foot on the road. In a matter of moments, Jake found himself alone on the porch with his grandfather, the old man and the mustache and the dog. The others had gone off in different directions, Lucille and Archie yelling for Hazel, the others yelling for Destiny. When the voices faded away, it was quiet. Uh, it was quiet on the porch, except for the snoring of the dog. The old man stuck out his hand toward Jake. Zedediah Applewhite, patriarch of the Apple, patriarch of the Applewhites clan, he said. How do you do? Jake looked at the wrinkled, spotty, knobby old hand. He was not about to shake the hand that had snatched one of the his last precious cigarettes. But he didn't have a choice. The old man grabbed his hand and shook it in both of his, nearly crushing Jake's fingers in an amazingly powerful grip. Welcome to Wits End Furniture Factory, Gallery, Studio, Goat Compound, and Creative Academy, Zedediah Applewhite said. When the old man let go, Jake shook his hand to make sure the blood could still go get to the tips of his fingers. Then he said a few of his favorite words, just loud enough to be sure they were heard. Zedidiah Applewhite didn't so much as blink. You ought to spend a little time with Cordelia, he said. She's taught my parrot the, the, uh, the French for that, Spanish, Italian, and German, too. That's kind of clever what he's doing there. So we got Jake trying to show himself, and he did it. He kind of got E.D.'s attention, but then when he does it to Zedidiah, Zedidiah's like, oh, hmm, it's good words. Just go ahead and tell my parrot. Or maybe you can talk to Cordelia. She'll teach you some other ways to say them. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting family. Chapter three in our final chapter for today. Edie sat in the kitchen pushing a mini wheat around in the milk at the bottom of her bowl, trying to let the, the shaft of early sunlight that fell across the table cheer her up. She wasn't crazy about mini wheats, but it was the only kind of cereal left in the house. She put her favorite kind on the list, but it was her father's turn to do the grocery shopping, and he'd forgotten. Again, <clears throat> a dry leaf detached itself from the drying wildflower arrangement in the middle of the table and drifted into her bowl. She fished it out. Cordelia had just gone through a flower arranging phase, and of course, her arrangements had been beautiful. She was a true apple white after all, which meant that whatever creative activity she put her mind to, she did it really well. But she'd gotten bored with flower arranging, and now the, bou the bouquets were blackening all over the house. By the time anybody did anything with them, there'd be nothing left but dry, empty stems and slimy water. By then, by then even Cordelia probably wouldn't remember how they'd gotten there. There was a disturbing lack of focus and follow-up in her family. Uh, <coughs> true artsy types. Edie didn't know how she could have been born an Applewhite. She wasn't anything at all like the rest of them. Even her mother and Aunt Lucille, who were only Applewhites by marriage, were more like them than she was. Applewhites were enormously talented. She was not. Applewhites thrived on chaos. Edie wanted organization and sense. Applewhites love spontaneity. E.D. wanted a schedule to play in she could count on. Applewhites craved freedom. E.D. wanted structure. It was way too early for her to be up, but she'd wakened before dawn and from nightmares she couldn't quite remember, except that Jake Simple had been in them. She hadn't been able to get back to sleep. This was the day he was going. he would be moving in. The Applewhites were determined to find the good kid under the bad exterior. It didn't seem to occur to them that the kid might be bad all the way through. His own grandfather, a man who looked a little shell-shocked, seemed all too eager to get rid of him. Hadn't anyone noticed that? Edie spooned the last mini-wheat into her mouth, 
put the bowl on the floor for Winston, who was uh, sleepily, sleeping noisily at her feet, and then sat, elbows on the table, chin resting in her fist, staring into the early sunlight. Yesterday, after the goats had been rounded up and her four-year-old brother, Destiny, had been found digging for pirate treasure between the circle of carrots and the circle of tomatoes in Lucille's vegetable garden, there had been a family meeting. Everybody had been there except, of course, her older brother, Hal. Hal was just was not just a typical introverted artist. Sometime in the last year, he had become an actual recluse. He didn't he didn't come out of his room except as far as anyone could tell in the middle of the night when he was reasonably certain everyone else would be asleep. The point of the family meeting had been to outline the plan for Jake's assimilation into the Creative Academy. It was worse than uh, than she'd feared. He was going to be in her class. This ought to have been an impossibility. The Creative Academy did not have classes. One of the main reasons the Creative Academy had been started in the first place was to avoid what her father called clumping. Apple whites, he said, didn't shouldn't be required to do what other people did just because other people did it. Apple whites weren't like other people. It had all started when Cordelia was in the seventh grade at Traybridge Middle School and was told by a teacher that she wasn't allowed to paint a zebra black and purple because zebras were really black and white. The fact that the zebra in question was part of a science report, not an art project, hadn't made any difference to Randolph Applewhite. Real science demands of creativity and individuality. He had told the principal when he withdrew for his uh, three older kids from the school district the very next day, without creativity and individuality, there would be no scientific discovery, no Galileo, no Newton, no Einstein. If her father had been safely off directing a play somewhere when the zebra issue came up, she had Cordelia and even Hal might, uh, might still be going to school in Traybridge to a regular school with schedules and organization and a great many normal people, including Melissa, her best friend, whom she never got to see in person anymore. But Randolph hadn't been off directing. He had been at home that with time on his hands. Worse, a theater company that had hired him to direct a play for them had called only that morning to tell him they had decided not to do that play. So they didn't need him after all. He had been feeling rejected. Artists were tricky enough to handle when, they, when their work was going extremely well. Rejected artists could be downright dangerous. Within a week, the Creative Academy had been uh, registered with the State Department of Education and was up and running. It was turned into uh, it had turned into quite it had it turned out to be quite easy to start a home school in North Carolina. All that was required was a guarantee that the teachers had high school diplomas. That was no problem. The academy teachers were the Applewhite adults, and all of them except Uncle Archie had finished college. Even Uncle Archie, who had dropped out of high school to travel the world on a tramp steamer, had eventually gotten a GED so that he could enroll in art school for a while. It hadn't been necessary to file a curriculum with the state, which was a good thing because the Applewhites didn't believe in telling the children what to study and when. The Creative Academy wasn't so much a homeschool as an unschool. Its students were supposed to follow their own interests and create their own educational plans. Separately, Individual, uh, separately, individually, creatively. That meant that, except for EED, nobody had any sort of educational plan at all. And, of course, nobody was ever doing the same thing as anybody else at the same time. Until now. Now Jake was to follow EED's plan. She didn't want him to. She had created her plan just for her. She had thought it up for herself, and she wanted to accomplish it by herself. She might not have talent. She might not have a creative bone in her body, but she wasn't half bad at learning. She had reminded the family about the Academy's philosophy, about individuality, the case against clumping, but she could have saved her breath. She and Jake Simple were to be a class. Part of the reason was math. Up until yesterday, she liked math. Nobody else in the family did. 
Two and two added up to four, no matter who added them. And they were right. They're right on adding. Uh, they were right on adding up to four month after month and year after year. It's what Edie had always liked about it. Everybody else found it boring. If homeschooled kids didn't have to take standardized tests once a year, tests that included math, Edie felt sure there wouldn't be any math learned at the academy at all. Since they did have to take those tests, they took math online. Edie was ex exactly where Jake Sipple's last report card from the school had um so he was exactly where Jake Simple's last report card from the school he'd burned down said he was. Seventh grade, geometric problem solving, comparing uh, percentiles and fractions. Edie pulled another dry leaf from the drying bouquet. She had told them that she was willing to be clumped with Jake for math, just not everything else. But it Hadn't done any good. Jake Simple needed to do cooperative learning so he could become better socialized, they said. And she was the only genuinely cooperative member of the family. Besides, he wasn't the sort of person yet who could be expected to come up with his own structure and organization. He needs to begin at least with yours, Zedediah had said. And that had been that. Edie thought of the fat three ring binder that it held her curriculum for the first half of this year. It gave her life order, stability, predictability. It had taken her a whole week in August to plan it out. There were uh, sections for each subject, and for each one, she had written down her goals and listed every project she planned to do to meet those goals. Then she would made charts and timelines and squares to check off each step as it was completed. So far, she was right on schedule. If she had to catch Jake Simple up on what she had done in each subject so far, it would throw everything into chaos. Winston was awake now, lying with his stubby front paws out, each uh, out, paws on each side of the cereal bowl, lapping up milk and leaking foamy saliva on Edie's sneakers and his own ears. Edie sighed. Oh, she loathed and despised chaos. There's our first three chapters. Well, there's a lot to there. So now we've got now we've met the Apple Whites. We met Jake Simple. Um, we've learned that yes, even though they are homeschooled, they still have to take tests. There's still things. It was neat. What would you all like? Would you all like to come up with your own your own uh, educational plan? I mean. As teachers, that's what we use to teach you. That's what we use to, we say, okay, I've got to teach you fractions now. And after fractions, we got to teach a little bit of decimals. And before fractions, I had to teach you geometry. Well, in the Applewhite's Creative Academy, they, had, they came up with whatever they wanted to. But they still had to take those tests. Hmm. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the first three chapters. Like I said, it begins out kind of heavy, but then it gets going. It's, it's, we're going to enjoy this book. Um, one suggestion I'd make for tomorrow is uh, maybe if you want, maybe take a little paper and jot down some questions, and then you can put it in the chat or maybe put it in the comments down below, like some questions you might have for something I read, from something I read. Maybe I was – maybe I read it too fast. Maybe I used a word you didn't know. Like I know these words like spontaneity, meaning things that happen like – like without a reason or just like jumping and without thinking. Uh, there was another word I saw over here that I really, really liked. I thought we could talk about the creativity. We had, there's all kinds of great vocabulary words in here. There's all kinds of great, let's see if I can find it. Do, 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 do. I can't, but that's okay. But like I said, write those, put them in the chat, put them down below in the comments. I promise you, I will answer them. All right. Well, with that being said, Hope everybody has a wonderful evening. It's Saturday night. It's spring break. Woo! Celebrating spring break when it's still the same thing as it was yesterday. But um, to the Albans, hello. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. And on that note, I will see you tomorrow at 6.30. Bye.